Good evening, and welcome to the 2020 Candidates Forum. My name is Gertrude Whitaker, the director of the Fayette County Chamber of Commerce. Along with the Chamber, this event is co-sponsored by Whitewater Broadcasting Corporation, Connorsville News Examiner, and Connorsville TV3. These partners provided much time and resources to advertise and set up tonight's event, and for that, we are very grateful. The sponsors are nonpartisan organizations. We do not support candidates, nor do we support any political parties. Now, nonpartisan does not mean nonparticipation. We do take positions on issues, even through events such as tonight's forum. We encourage Fayette County citizens to be informed before you go to the polls or mail your ballot. We invited the community to submit questions for offices with contested races on this year's ballot. Thank you to those who participated. We'll try to include those questions in tonight's event. The offices with contested races are the Fayette County School Board and the Fayette County Council. To effectively execute their responsibilities of elected office, winners of this year's general election must clearly understand local and district governance and have strong commitment to advancing outcomes that benefit the students and residents of this community. Tonight, it's for voters of Fayette County. You will select leadership that determines achievement of all students' outcomes and the fiscal oversight of your tax dollars. Choose wisely. It is my privilege to introduce Grady Tate, who is tonight's moderator. Mr. Tate is well known for his sports journalism with our local newspaper. He was recently promoted to editor of the Connorsville News Examiner. Mr. Tate will review the rules for this forum with the candidates and then begin questions. Mr. Tate. Thank you. The format for tonight's candidates forum is as follows. Each candidate will be allowed 90 seconds for an opening statement, followed by questions asked by the moderator. Each candidate will be asked the same question and allowed two minutes to answer. No candidate may speak after the time allotted. Time limits will be enforced. Candidates will receive a 30 second warning and a signal when their time has expired. After the Q&A, candidates will have 90 seconds to make closing remarks. This is not a debate. Leslie Jacobs, what do you see as the board's roles and responsibilities? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Leslie, you, you have 90 seconds for an opening statement. I'm sorry. Thank you. And I want to thank the sponsors of tonight's uh, candidate forum. My name is Leslie Jacobs. Outside of being a school board member currently, I am a licensed clinical social worker and have been in private practice for over 25 years. I am married to Matthew Bridgeford. We own a dairy farm and an artisan cheese business, which I'm often called the cheese lady. Uh, we have three daughters. They all attended Fayette County Schools. And I have been on the school board for um, currently for the f a four-year term, and I served previous previously in 2009 until 2012. Um, as a school board member, I am also part of the Indiana School Board Association and have attended numerous events and have enjoyed uh, learning more about governance and keeping up with my own education so I can best serve the community. I also enjoy a number of volunteer activities namely working with the food insecure population um, as well as being on the trails committee for the local park district. And I look forward to tonight's questions. Thank you. Tim Bentley, you now have 90 seconds for an opening statement. All right. Well, first I want to say thank you for allowing me to be here. I'll try to keep it to 90 seconds. Just gong me if I don't. <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, I grew up here in uh, Fayette County. I um, actually grew up in District 2, the district I'm running for. I recently moved back out there after my father passed away, back to the family farm. Uh, so the only school that is in the district, which is Everton, is where I grew up at. Uh, that's the school I went to. Um, married to my wife for going on 25 years, my wife Gina. Um, we've got three kids, uh, one of which, our oldest, is going to school to be a teacher. Our middle son just graduated from Cedarville University. 
and just started his first year teaching at Rushville, uh, as well as my wife uh, is working on her bachelor's uh, to be an elementary ed teacher, and she's currently a Title I teacher. So uh, education's a passion. Uh, as far as me, I work uh, at Hydro, formerly SAPA. I'm an engineer there. I'm also a licensed realtor, uh, so I'm uh, on the board of realtors, and uh, we have a, a private business as well, Gene and I do. Uh, I've served on the board of works, I've been involved in numerous other communities and uh, activities in the community, and excited to be able to bring some uh, new life to the school board uh, and some new ideals, and most importantly, to listen to the teachers and their concerns uh, in the classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Jacobs, what do you see as the board's roles and responsibilities? Well, the school board role is to hire the superintendent and establish policy. I think uh, many in the community think we run the schools, but we don't run the schools. We hire a superintendent to run the schools. And I, I think that's an important distinction so that the voters know that. Um, that doesn't mean that we aren't involved on um, an oversight level with the runnings of the school, but we do not run the schools. Um, in that capacity, though, as a board member, we do approve and or disapprove of those items that are brought forth to us um, at meetings. And uh, personally, I spend a great deal of time researching um, looking up articles. I'm quite known for sending articles to the board members and the superintendent that I find that are um, significant to things that we're going to be discussing at meetings. Uh, I also try to make myself as available as possible um, to my constituents, to teachers, to all those in the community. So I hope that in my role as a board member that I continue to um, meet the public where they need to be met, and serve the needs of all the children of Fayette County. Thank you. Tim Bentley, what do you see as the board's roles and responsibilities? Well, I believe the board is, uh, is and should be a support to the superintendent and the assistant and the administration, but, but I also would have to disagree a little bit. I believe the board is a voted position. I believe the board members should uh, speak up when there's maybe a time to do that. Uh, most people don't realize, I don't think, our school is the highest taxing entity in our county. Almost $38 million flows through that school board. That is more than our city and county combined. Um, so they're tasked with a great deal of uh, financial responsibility. So I believe the responsibility of that board member is to be a good steward of the money uh, and to direct the school corporation and the board in the best, the best direction as we can that would benefit everyone involved, the, the teachers, the families, the students, the admin. And I think we have to look at that entire picture and decide when we're making our decision what the best fit is. Tim Bentley, if elected primarily as a representative of the community or as a representative of the school system? Well, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> um, I would see myself as a representative of both. Uh, I believe you have to find a balance. Uh, so certainly I think you have to represent the school system and what's in the best interest, even though it is an educational institution. It's still a business. Uh, but in the same respect, I believe we have to do things in the best interest of our community uh, and those affected by it. Leslie Jacobs, elected, would you see yourself primarily as a representative of the community or as a representative of the school system? I would say mostly I'm a representative of the community and seeing uh, that we meet the best interest of the students. Um, we are not paid employees, though we do receive a stipend, and we do represent the best interests of all those who serve in the school corporation. Um, however, we are there for the students, and those students belong to families that are out in our community, and also to all the taxpayers who pay money in their daily taxes 
to um, that, and some of that money goes to fund the schools. Um, I take very seriously the role of being a school board member and my responsibility to the staff, to the other school board members. We are a body of seven. We don't act as individuals. Um, and of course, in my role as currently as president of the school board, I see it very important that I um, make sure that I lead in an appropriate way and serve our school board in a responsible way, as well as our superintendent. However, I believe that for the most part, I am there for the students and for the community. Thank you. Thank you. Leslie Jacobs, do you think there are any corrections needed in the district's budget? Bloat in one area or not enough funding in another? Please explain. And I apologize for sitting down to those patrons who are watching. I've been uh, managing a so I apologize for that. Um, in the past four years, the community, who I don't expect watches all the school board meetings, though we would love to have you watch, um, we have cut over 650000 in the budget through attrition. We have had three uh, administrators that have left through attrition, through resignation or retirement, and have not needed to replace those. When we hired the current superintendent, who is quite a visionary, um, he had some goals and shared those with the board, and we very much agreed that we needed to prepare ourselves for the financial future. The legislature did provide an increase in funding for, t uh, for teachers and for schools. 90% of our funding that we receive all goes to salaries and benefits. So. Um, it's very important that we get that funding, and all of our funding is state and federal funds, so and, and grants. So it's significant that we um, have been able to make some cuts in our budget, and that's all been through attrition. In the meantime, all staff has received approximately a 9% increase in their wages in the last four years. And if you looked back 10 years, the amount that Fayette County Schools has spent on teacher salaries has stayed the same because through attrition we have lost some teachers and haven't needed to replace them and that's because of declining enrollment which is a whole other subject. However, through that process our teachers have still been able to maintain a raise and we have been good managers of our money and therefore we have not spent more in 10 years on the salaries of our teachers and staff and that's for all staff. They've all received the same increase in pay. Thank you. Percent increase. Thank you. Tim Bentley, do you think there are any corrections needed in the district's budget? Bloat in one area or not enough funding in another? Please explain. Yeah, I do think there's some areas we can improve in. Like I said, the school receives around $38 million a year. Um, as I looked up Fayette County, I looked up Rush, Wayne, Union County. About all the schools are typically budgeting about 50 to 60% for education and about 30 to 40% in what they call ops. And if any, anybody watching is interested in looking any of this up, it's all on Indiana Gateway. Uh, you can find all of this information, uh, fact check me, whatever you want to do. Um, but, you know, one of my concerns is that we, uh, you know, we've spent some money here recently that we really didn't have. Uh, the school currently has about $4.8 million in debt. Um, our current teacher salary average is about $43,000 here in Fayette County. The state average is $57,000. So you can see that we're quite a bit lower than the state average. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons we struggle with keeping teachers staying here. Um, I know several teachers that live here in Fayette County that drive to other counties, my son being one of them. Um, another issue that concerns me as I looked up administration and principals, if you look up their average salary, and I get they're educated and we certainly ought to compensate them, but their average salary is about $91,000, so more than double the people that's on the ground doing the footwork. Um, and then I also believe uh, in our admin office, we have 11 employees there with an average salary of $62,000. That's from the secretaries all the way up to the superintendent. A lot of the other schools around here do not have near that heavy of administration. 
And as Leslie said, our numbers are declining. If they are, then maybe we need to look at cutting some of those areas and putting that money into the classrooms, into the teachers' pockets, uh, and uh, we could retain those people better, I believe. Tim Bentley, what are two overall needs that must be priorities for our school districts to address? And why do you see these as needs? And how would you go about achieving them? Well, again, I think we have to retain our, our teachers, no doubt about it. We have to, to retain them. And I think that that goes to achieve that, we would have to look at ways to work within the budget to maybe uh, reposition some of that money, again, to put it into the classrooms where these teachers are working, put it into their pockets and such. Um, the other focus that I believe, number one, teacher retention. The second thing is I think we, we've got to do better as a county. Uh, I've been in um, manufacturing about 24 years, been involved in a number of, uh, with a number of Japanese companies where there was a big influx to transplant companies to the U.S. One of the number one things they look at when they look at cities to move to is education and quality of life. Again, if you, if you get on the Indiana uh, Gateway, the Indiana uh, page, you can, you can find out where we rate as a county. And I'll be quite honest with you, we don't rate all that well. Uh, from 2018 to 2019, all of our school scores dropped except for the high school. It went up a little bit. Um, we've got a couple schools, Grandview and Maplewood, that are extremely low, and I'm not sure why that is. But almost the, the, the core scores are almost half of the other schools. So I think we have to, teacher retention is, is number one, and I think part of that's reflected with this. Uh, and, and the next thing is providing a better quality of education to bring our school up into those higher numbers statewide. And that's something we want. That's something we ought to be proud of if, once we achieve it. Thank you. Leslie Jacobs. What are two overall needs that must be priorities for our school district to address? And why do you see these as needs? And how would you go about achieving them? So we have a tremendous problem with declining enrollment. Um, this year alone, we lost 100 students. And there's lots of reasons for declining enrollment. We don't have much opportunity for business in this community. So people are not flocking to Fayette County for that. Um, so we really need to increase teacher salary. I would say that, although we have done a great job with what we have. But I served on the Indiana School Board Association Legislative Committee for two years and set, aside, set up um, legislative priorities and foundations for our legislatures, legislators. I also arranged uh, two meetings for our legislators to come to Fayette County and meet with teachers and talk to them about their needs and what they were seeing in the classroom. Uh, Tim's comment about the two schools, and, and now Maplewood is the Little Spartans uh, preschool. It's full-time preschool. We are one of the only ones in the state that offers such an arrangement. We have about 200 kids in the last two years. We've had over 400. Because we have a poverty rate that hovers around 62 to 70%, depending on which uh, school you're talking about. Grandview and Maplewood have extremely high poverty rates. Families that live in poverty do not have all the benefits that other families do. Hence, the tremendous need for early childhood education. And so the Little Spartans Preschool which is free and offered in this community, is a wonderful means by which to bring those children up with the rest of the children that come into school at kindergarten. So that is one need. I would certainly say that we have needs for safety, both with COVID, with the school shootings. Um, and we've done a lot of work in that regard, but there's more work to be done. Thank you. Leslie Jacobs. What is your philosophy of special education, and what do you think our school district can do to increase inclusive practices? That's a wonderful question. Uh, we have a wonderful special ed department, and uh, we have developmental preschool, which is a, a 
I don't know how many classrooms we have right now, one or two at Little Spartans daycare that it, or preschool that is specifically for those children that have special needs. So beginning early is a, a good attempt to uh, one, involve families and help teach them how to meet the needs of their children as well as providing those children with an extra boost before they get to school. Um, in terms of inclusion, we have lots of options in our school. We have instituted over the last couple of years um, a philosophy that involves social emotional learning. You'll see the initials SEL. And teachers are trained to work with children of all abilities, but also our special ed kids. And uh, teaching them how to manage their emotions, how to regulate, how to respond to stimuli. Um, and oftentimes our special needs kiddos need some extra supports in that regard. Uh, in several of our schools, in the hallways, you'll see little breakout areas where children who are overwhelmed, children who need a break, um, whether they're special needs or not, have an opportunity to regroup and to be able to give their brain a break so that they can come back to the classroom. And teachers are trained to work specifically with those populations. I think that we do a good job of trying to have inclusion in our classrooms. And um, we have aides that provide some of that for our classrooms. So I think we are on target with those kinds of efforts. And with the addition of the social emotional learning, as well as the um, developmental preschool, I think that we're getting kids a head start early. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Bentley, what is your philosophy of special education and what do you think our school district can do to increase inclusive practices? Um, well, on the topic of special ed, you know, I would agree with Leslie. We have to intervene as soon as possible. Uh, and there's different levels. I mean, not every student is going to learn the same. I think we have to find creative ways to be able to to teach that particular student, we need to figure out where their, uh, wh where their weaknesses are and try to develop those. Um, and again, like I said, there's different ranges of, of special needs. There may be some that are more severe and some that are not. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, those teachers need to be able to find uh, those areas, need to be able to develop those areas. And again, as Leslie said, a lot of the aides help with, the, with this role with special ed. Uh, I mentioned earlier my wife works as Title I, so that's part of her responsibility is to work with some of these special needs kids and such. And I do know talking to her and some other teachers, sometimes they feel like they're on a lonely island because some of these special need kids are very, um, they require a lot of attention. Uh, so, you know, I believe one thing that we need to do as a community, as a school board and such, is maybe try to, to provide some more resources with that get a little more parent engagement. And I know that's easy to say. Some parents just, you know, it's more like a daycare. Here's my kid. I'll be back to get him at three o'clock or whatever. But it's really got to be a team effort. You know, uh, I always took the philosophy, philosophy when I raised my kids that I wasn't raising them on my own. It, it takes a village to raise a kid. Um, I told my kids, uh, hey, you need to look at other people to look, to invest in, to mentor you and such. And uh, so I really think it's got to be a team effort. We got to find these kids where they're at, try to develop them, but we got to give the teachers in the classroom the resources and not just leave them out there because sometimes it's, it can be very stressful uh, in these situations. Thank you. Tim Bentley, what responsibilities, if any, should districts assume for dealing with such societal problems as poverty, hunger, emotional illness, or drug abuse? Um, again, I, certainly we ought to be involved uh, at all levels. And, uh, you know, the, there's a million different ways of how we do that. But, uh, uh, you know, I think we, as far as poverty, hunger, drugs, these are all real issues. Uh, I know a lot of the, uh, the staff from the sheriff department, they go in and they try to, uh, to explain and try to curve some of these children's future behaviors. Uh, poverty, I mean, really, the, all we can do is kind of, you know, teach these y young kids, the youth, that they can do better. You don't have to settle with where you're at. You know, the sky's the limit for you. Encourage them. Um, you know, as far as hunger, I know there's a lot of initiatives 
as far as that goes in trying to make sure these kids get their bellies full and stuff. And again, you know, talking to my wife, I know a lot of times there's kids that, that don't, don't get to eat. They come to school hungry. They, they come to school maybe not with the best hygiene and such. So, uh, you know, and that just goes to the point that these teachers do a whole lot more than teach. A lot of times these teachers are a mom to these kids. These teachers are uh, a cook to these kids. Uh, uh, you know, there's a ton of resources that these teachers are um, trying to, uh, to bring to these children's level. So, yes, absolutely, I think we need to be involved as much as we can, whenever we can, however we can. So, thank you. Leslie Jacobs, what responsibilities, if any, should districts assume for dealing with such societal problems as poverty, hunger, emotional illness, or drug abuse? Well, in today's age, with our students being in school uh, at least six hours a day, if not longer, we have after school programs and such and sports, we absolutely need to take responsibility. And in this community, with a high poverty rate, as we said, we have done quite a bit. Um, we operate a food pantry at Maplewood that is available to all parents of uh, children in Fayette County Schools. We participate in Gleaner's Food Bank and food distribution. We also have a back sack program and principals identify those students that come from families that have higher needs and provide a backpack that goes home on the weekends that has food supply for the entire weekend. Um, in addition to that, we have a wonderful food service program in Chartwells, and they provide food at our school breaks. They provided food during the summer, during the COVID, um, the early COVID days in March and April, they provided food to families. Uh, so on the food insecurity side, I think that uh, Fay County School Corporation is a leader. Um, and we continue to work in any way we can to manage those needs of our students. In terms of drug use, if we know that a student is using, they are referred to counseling. We have Meridian in our schools that can provide counseling on site. That's a contract we have with Meridian that also helps to meet not just drug issues, but mental health issues. The status of mental health in our communities right now is horrible. As a counselor, I will say that I see more anxiety in young people than I have 25 years ago, than I have 10 years ago. And I think our, we have now hired social workers in every building, so our students are getting quality care for their needs. So I think we have a tremendous responsibility and I think we've really stepped up. Those are the questions that we have for tonight's forum. I'd like to thank both candidates for being here. Um, Tim Bentley, you now have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Okay. Um, Anyways, I, I want to start off with this. Uh, it's a Proverbs. Uh, it says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I, I really believe that. That's one of my life mottos, creed, or whatever. And I'm very, very thankful for the teachers in my life as I came up through uh, school here in Fayette County that I had some teachers. I wasn't the best student. I know that's shocking to some people. Um, but, uh, you know, I had some teachers that come up alongside me and said just the things that I just said, you know, hey, you know, you pick yourself back up. You can do better. Keep pushing forward. Keep moving forward. Uh, and now, you know, I work, I've worked in a number of different companies, but I'm an engineer uh, and uh, I have a great life for my family. And uh, so I, that would be my, my number one thing is we've got to sharpen iron. We've got to sharpen these kids. We've got to develop them. Uh, tell them the sky's the limit. Uh, you know, a couple things I just want to give a real quick, some bullet points to. Uh, we've got to invest into our students and staff. Uh, we need to get more money into the classrooms, continue to provide safe learning environments. We have to be a voice for our teachers. Don't leave them out on the island by themselves. Uh, we need to be financially responsible. And I'm going to end with this. We have to find a solution for the mobile library at Everton. The school corporation promised, whenever Orange and Alquina was demolished, that the school, the library situation was only temporary. They still have a library out there with no restroom in it. That's a mobile trailer. We've got to fix that issue. Again, I would encourage any of you, if you've got any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. 
Leslie Jacobs, you now have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Well, I just want to thank everybody for listening tonight. Um, I've really enjoyed serving the community on the school board. And I think that we've done some remarkable things in the last four years. It's been um, exciting to watch the uh, preschool program develop. We've had a wonderful um, relationship with the um, Chartwell School Food Program, not just for our kids in school, but for our kids outside of school. We've taken safety to a whole new level, uh, passive entries in all of our buildings. We've closed in the courtyard at the high school. Um, and I believe that safety, we hired a safety officer, we hired another couple of resource officers, and I feel that that demonstrates at least our commitment as a board and what we can do to support our schools. A board is made up of seven people, not just one person. And I feel very fortunate to have six other people that discuss, that weigh things, that look at issues together. And my hope would be that I would be reelected to the seat and be able to continue the good work that we've been doing in the schools up until this time. Thank you. We'd like to thank both of our candidates for coming tonight. And we're going to take a temporary pause for our listening audience. We'll have a short break to get ready for our next segment with our Fayette County Council candidates. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And we're back. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight for the 2020 Candidates Forum. Um, we're privileged this evening that following our um, forum for the Fayette County Board of Education, we now have the six candidates um, have joined us tonight that are in the contested race for the Fayette County Council seat. There are three open seats that the candidates are running for, and I'm going to turn it over to our terrific moderator, Mr. Grady Tate. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to welcome all the candidates to tonight's forum. The candidates on stage are Republican Scott Bevington, Republican Jim Wolf, Republican Kate Riker Payton, Democrat Holly Dunn, Democrat Tom Peck, and Democrat John Gibson. We'd like to welcome all of you here tonight. Let's go over the rules for tonight's candidates foreman, er, forum. Each candidate will be allowed 90 seconds for an opening statement, followed by questions asked by the moderator. Each candidate will be asked the same question and allowed two minutes to answer. No candidate may speak after the time allotted. Time limits will be enforced. Candidates will receive a 30-second warning and a signal when their time has expired. After the Q&A, candidates will have 90 seconds to make closing remarks. This is not a debate. So we'll begin with opening remarks, and we'll start with Republican Scott Bevington for his 90-second opening remark. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Good evening. I'm Scott Bevington, and I'm one of the Republican nominees seeking a seat on Fayette County Council. I grew up here. I graduated from CHS in 1987 and Ball State in 1991. I returned home shortly thereafter and have been here ever since. Together, my wife Diana and I have four grown children and two grandchildren. Currently, I'm a financial advisor with Edward Jones Investments. I've had a very diverse career. I've worked in grants, economic development, manufacturing, tourism, and finance. I've been an employer and an employee. I know how to build a budget, and I know how to live within one. Politically, I've been on the local Republican Central Committee for 22 years. I've been a nine-time Fayette County delegate to the State Republican Convention. Many years ago, I served on Connersville City Council for one term as a Republican, and I've been our party's chairman twice. However, it's been over a decade since I held office and a decade and a half since I sought one. Tonight, I'll tell you why I stopped running for office back then and why I've restarted now. I'd like to thank everyone for putting this 
form together, those responsible, and I look forward to sharing our views on how to make Fayette County a better place to live, work, and play. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Democrat Holly Dunn for a 90-second opening statement. Sure. Hi, I'm Holly Dunn, and I am currently sitting on county council. And this is the just the end of my first term, and I'll tell you, it has been a tremendous, tremendous learning experience. And, and you know what? At the same time, it's been a lot of fun. And I know that you know some people might not think that local government can be fun, but I'll, I'll tell you, we have... I, we have served together and have had a, um, a tremendous board that have worked together, and it, it has provided an opportunity for me to serve in ways that uh, I didn't necessarily anticipate when I first uh, ran for county council, but uh, it has been a, a tremendous learning experience. Uh, just a little bit about myself. In the past couple years, I became a foster parent, and here November 6th, I'll become, um, it'll be all, all official, and it'll be legal and behind us, and uh, I'll tell you, just slowing down the pace and relaxing a little bit in my words, it is my pleasure to serve you as a, as a county, county council person. And, and I'm going to tell you that uh, I continue to serve Fayette County in a variety of ways, and uh, it would be my honor to serve you again for another four years. Thank you. We'll now move to Republican Jim Wolf for a 90-second opening statement. My name is Jim Wolf. I'm 72 year I'm 72 years old and live in Fayette County all my life. I'm married to my wife Linda. We've been married for 40 years. I have two children and two grandchildren. My wife and I own Wolf's Gun Shop for 40 years. And I um, I started out. I graduated from Carnesville High School. I started out working when I was eight years old, and I'm still working 72. I know about budgets. I had to do it when I had my little paper out, and I had to do it at the gun shop. And when I first started the gun shop, we had people said, "You'll never make it. 40 years. I'm still going." And it's Fayette County is a nice community. I've been on the county council for eight years as Democrat. The reason I'm running for the Republican side this time is. The party came to me and asked me, uh, Democrat Party has left and went to the wayside as far as I'm concerned with their political views. So this is why I'm running for the Fayette County Council. I appreciate your vote. Thank you. This time we'll move to Democrat Thomas Tom Peck for a 90-second opening statement. Thank you. So my name's Tom Peck. I am a Hoosier by choice since 2012. I'm originally a Michigan resident, been all around this country, went to college in Ohio, went to college in uh, New York, been to Arkansas, traveled across the globe and just witnessed many things. Got a plethora of experience that I really just want to try and bring into this county. I worked in training for private companies. I was a training manager for various companies, local and out of state. I've taught in the schools. I've taught recovery in our local county jail and have worked in all different aspects of Fayette County and really just kind of gotten to know pretty much every kind of socioeconomic class we have. Got experience in budget management, grant writing, research, and risk analysis. And I've realized in my, you know, short term of being in Fayette County that I'm not dumb enough to think that I know everything, but I'm smart enough to realize that I can find it out. I've got two children who are going to spend the next two decades or more inside of Fayette County. I'm not here for the short term. I'm here to go through and make sure that this county keeps on going forward. I'm honestly not about winning elections. The goal for me is to improve our community. However I do that is going to be how I do that. Right now, it's for county council. In the future, it could be either way. Thank you. This time we'll move to Kay Riker Payton for <laughs> a 90 second opening statement. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kay Riker Payton, and I'm, current, I'm running for re election. I'm currently the vice president of council and a lifelong resident of Fayette County. I have one son, Jacob Payton. I hold a business degree from Indiana Wesleyan as well as being a grant writer. Currently, I serve on several committees and boards, a few of which are Eastern Indiana Regional Planning Commission, Fayette County Drug Coalition, Vice President Everton's Lions Club, and a United Way board member. Being on council has taught me many things. First, you have to be able to see both sides of the situation and keep an open mind and do what's best for the majority. 
Secondly, it takes time to see things come to fruition. Because of all the rules and regulations we are governed by, the Indiana State Code, I have attended several seminars and state call meetings by, held by the Association of Indiana Counties, which helps, which helps you become well-versed on county rules and regulations. County Council is a physical agent. We approve spending, which is 98% of what we do. The past four years, we have kept the county in the black, meaning that we have not had to rob Peter to pay Paul, like, had been, like has been in the years before me. We have also not had to lay anyone off, and we were able to give county employees this year long overdue raises. In, in this closing, at this moment, I just want to say if experience and dedication and genuine commitment is what you're seeking, and I'm serving this Fayette County residents, that's what I offer to you, and I would appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, we'll go to Democrat John Gibson for a 90-second opening statement. Well, good evening. Um, I am John Gibson. Um, I am a lifelong resident of Fayette County. Um, I was born and raised in Columbia, and I, for the last 10, 12 years, I've been here in the city of Connersville. Um, I have a daughter that um, is here, um, and then I am also, um, I have a bachelor's degree in marketing. Um, being on the council, uh, the county council, um, it would be something new to me, but that doesn't mean that I'm afraid to learn, and I'm hoping to bring some new ideas, and we have some work to do, um, and thank you. This time we'll move into the questioning, and I'm going to start with Republican Jim Wolf. Jim, what do you think your role as a commit as a council member is? The role of council member is is to look over the budget, make sure you got the money there to uh, provide for the budget. And if you don't, you have to go and see where you go cut. I've done. Uh, I was on it for eight years, and I've been through the budget hearings eight times. And there was a lot of cutting through the budget because usually the office holders will put in more than they want, and right off the bat, you know that. But it's looking over the money and make sure you got it there to put out. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Democrat Tom Peck. Tom, what do you think your role as a council member is? Honestly, my role as a council member at that point would just be to make sure that the constituents of Fayette County, the taxpayers of Fayette County, are seeing where their money goes and are getting a positive return for the money that they give us. The entire role of county council is to write the checks for what the county needs. We have right now seen a explosion of spending in our county. We've seen our county end up spending 63% more since 2011. We have seen that the county itself has been struggling and admittedly is getting better due to two of the people that are sitting on this stage right now. Thank you guys so much for the work that you have done. The county, the council that is on there has done amazing work and I am so glad that they have. But we need to do better. We need to find new things. Our taxpayer base is going to struggle with this COVID situation. For the next two years, we are going to have a very, very tough time with this. And we need fresh ideas. We need fresh things to be able to come through and find solutions. I'm hoping that I can be that fresh voice either on the council or off of it. I'm not gonna be leaving and it's gonna be in your guys' best interest to vote for me because if I'm on the council, you can control me. If not, I'm gonna be able to spout off whenever. <laughs> Next, we'll move to Republican K. Riker Payton. K., what yes. do you think your role as a commissioner or council member is? Well, um, it, we are the physical agent. We approve the spending. That is 98% of our job. However, we have had to be a little creative and think outside the box, and we have investigated, tracked down, researched grants that are out there to supplement our revenue. One of the problems with our revenue streams is that the assessed values are off, and that's something that that department has to handle. That's not something that council handles. So, but it is being talked amongst 
commissioners and the assessor's office and between us, but that's not something we govern. But our the council approves spending. We have been frugal, and like I said before, we've been in the black for the past four years, which is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we'll move to Democrat John Gibson. John, what do you think your role as a council member is? Um, the biggest thing is to be responsible to the taxpayer but find that fine line to also keep in mind of the county workers so you got to f the main focus is the taxpayer and how to spend their money and how to best to what they want and what they need um, and listen to their voices obviously um, and also we got and to live within our means um, they have been doing a great job right now, um, but there's always room for improvement. And as Tom pointed out, um, with the COVID situation, things are going to be tough, and it's going to come up with some new creative ideas and new ways to look on how to, um, to overcome those. Um, and that's the job of the, of, that would be something that I would be looking forward to do. So, thank you. thank you. Now we'll move to Democrat Holly Dunn. Holly, what do you think your role as a council member is? Thank you um, again for hosting this tonight. As a county council person, you're, you are the physical agent, as Kay said. And, and what I think that you don't necessarily always see is that we are behind the scenes looking and working uh, to try to stretch every dollar that comes into Fayette County. Uh, a, a perfect example, if you... I mean, you know, public financial hearings are always public, and you are the public is always welcome to attend those. Um, if you look at the past four years, we have met on average around 20 times or so during that financial hearing time just to go through line by line every single person's budget. And I'll tell you what I've noticed over the, the four year period of time is um, in that first year, maybe even the second year, we, we were cutting every single penny that we could, if that even meant like custodial. I mean, like toilet paper got cut <laughs> the first year. And, and, and where we are this year compared to then is, is, you know, those department heads know how frugal we are and how, how tight our budget is. And, and really what they submitted to us this year on that, on that plan um, was below our budget. They, they didn't come to us with an exuberant amount, but, but they really, you know, came to us knowing already ahead of time what we need in order to stay within budget and also knowing that we we are talking about COVID and we do expect those cuts and so no one asked for raises uh, in the past three years we've really you know been able to be strategic and trying to pay our employees better and so I, I just bring it to a bow uh, like a, a tie a bow on this idea we do look for grants. We have hired, um, had interns, and we have done things in the last four years that we've never done before. And I, I would uh, say that we have to continue to do that and look for ways like, you know, healthcare in the jail. And we, we've been able to bundle that and um, put it under a, an outsource that has cut costs significantly. So I just encourage you to go back and look at that. For the next question, we're going to start with. Hey, can I answer that question? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Scott. That's okay. Yes, definitely, Scott. <laughs> Scott Bevington, what do you think your role as a council member is? Well, simply, it's to be a community leader. Um, the Indiana Code has specifics about what a county councilman can do, but. I don't know if people of Fayette County really much care what the Indiana Code says about it. Um, I think whether you're running for mayor or city council or county council or county commissioner or dog catcher or any other elected office um, that might be out there, if you're an elected official, I think the people of Fayette County expect you to be a community leader and to ask the questions that um, will get conversation started to push our community forward. And I hope to be the kind of county council person that, that does that. Now, statutorily, the main job, obviously, is budgetary. But one of the 
things thinking outside the box that I'm calling for tonight is the establishment of a formalized procurement commission. A group of people that help determine what opportunities may exist um, in coordinating purchases throughout all county offices. This isn't brain surgery. It's the same concept that made Sam's Club a billion dollar business. You increase your purchasing power and reduce your costs by buying in bulk. So I think it's worth the time and effort to um, see if we can't find significant cost savings. So I'm hopeful that that's something that I could push forward. Thank you, and I apologize. That's okay. <laughs> Moving on to the second question, um, let's hear from Democrat John Gibson. John, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Well, um, great question. <laughs> um, frankly, um, that's just new, new blood, new ideas, new ways of thinking, um, and and just formulate um, you know more focus I'm also somebody who's very dedicated to the jobs he's done I've held the same job for 17 years um, just because of dedication and that's the same thing I would do with this um, but it's just that focus of we got to be creative um, and, and just looking at that and then also we also have to work as a team that's the thing the council's got to focus on. This work is a team. So those are things. Okay, thank you. This time we'll move to Scott Bevington. Scott, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I've had a very diverse career. I've, um, I think that uh, my career experiences um, are, are pretty hard to match. I've developed strong relationships in business and at all levels of government, local, state, and federal. Most of all, my current occupation requires me to be a fiduciary. In other words, I'm legally obligated to do what's in my client's best interests over my own. Um, I do this every day, and I'm good at it. Um, I'm not out to buy your vote or settle scores. I'm out to serve you, period. So. Um, that's the kind of, of thought process that I bring to the job and that I'll bring to it every day. Thank you. This time we'll move to Holly Dunn. Holly, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Sure. I, I believe that probably the, the biggest um, asset that I bring to the table is I am able to hear more than one side of a story and come up with my own independent idea. And, and I'll tell you, when you work on a council so closely as this, you have to get along with each other and you have to be able to like agree to disagree at times. Cause let me tell you, it's, you don't, it's not always just a super easy thing, you know? And so what I bring is I have a wide variety of people that I work with in our community. I, I'm, I'm very involved in nonprofits, in the faith community, and, and I've always been engaged. And so I'm going to be able to hear ideas and, and talk to people and bring those to the table and get along with people. And so I think, I think that's probably the biggest thing I bring to the table. This time we move to Republican Jim Wolf. Jim, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Well, I've been on the council, was on the council for eight years, and I've been in business for 40 years, and I know how to get stuff done, how to save money, and not overspend. And ideas to uh, save money, um, on my closing speak, I'm going to bring something up where I saved the county $400,000 while I was on there before, so. Okay. This time we'll move to Kay Riker Payton. Kay, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Well, as I said before, I'm currently the vice president on council, so it would be my experience and my knowledge of the code and the um, rules and regulations, my dedication, my community um, involvement and leadership, and my grant writing skills. And uh, as Holly alluded to, the willingness, we have a great council now 
and we, um, we can agree to disagree. And everyone's open-minded, so we have a great, a great current council. Thank you. This time we'll move to Democrat Tom Peck. Tom, what positive impact can you immediately bring to the council? Going on and thinking about immediate impact into the council, and in my view, is short-sighted. The council does not deal with things that is going to happen in the next month, two months. The council has to think a year, two years, 20 years down the road. My immediate impact is, first off, just going to be learning what it is for council to do. The budget is incredibly complicated. Okay, I've been into the Indiana Gateway. It's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. It's confusing. Like I said before, I'm not dumb enough to think that I know everything, but I am smart enough to figure it out. My immediate impact is first off going to be a sponge. You know, like Holly said, I know people. She knows people. All of us up here know people that we can go and listen to. We have a wide breadth of experience. My immediate impact is going to be a coalition builder. All right. If you guys follow me on Facebook, I've said before that I was a bad Republican when I was, you know, growing up. I'm a bad Democrat now because I'm a polypartisan, right? The only reason that I'm listed as a Democrat on here is because I have to be. I don't see party lines. I need to be able to go and talk to people and see all these different things and be able to bring people in on both sides. I've had many conversations with Scott. I've had conversations with Holly. I've had conversations with all of my other people that are on these. It's about building coalitions. If you want to say that I'm going to have an immediate impact, it's going to be because no matter what happens, I'm going to be talking to people. I'm going to be able to go through and say, this might be a good idea. Let's bring this forward. Let's go and find something else. Let's go research this. Let's go to Rushville and see what they're doing. Let's go here and see what they're doing. And let's talk to other counties and build this coalition. So that way, not only do we grow Fayette County, we grow Indiana itself. For our third question, we're going to begin with Kay Riker Payton. Kay, what is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay and classification are part-time less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. What's my view on the health insurance for all the county employees? County council members and county commissioners. Oh, for them not to have it and just the county employees to have Just what is your viewpoint on it? Okay. Um, well, legally you can't give it to county employees and not give it to council and commissioners. So we checked into that. So it would be um, open up a can of worms if we did that, something like that. Okay. Tom, what is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay and classification are part-time less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. So first off, I was not even aware that it was an option for county council members and county commissioners to have health insurance. I assumed as elected officials that are part-time and at that pay, that pay pace rate that they were part-time and not able to gather health insurance. So that is news to me. Honestly, you know, Talking with Kay's situation, she has the experience in this. She's obviously, the council has obviously talked about this situation before. Legally, if hands are tied, hands are tied, but there has to be some kind of opt-in agreement with that kind of stuff. If I'm elected to council, I won't need the health insurance. I'm already covered. Okay. All right. Scott Bevington, what is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay and classification are part-time less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. Well, if it's not possible, it's not possible. But that is um, pretty funny that government officials have that option. Name me anyone else in a part-time position that's offered health insurance by their employer. 
Um, if I'm elected, I won't take it. And that's, uh, that's really all I can say about that. Okay, thank you. Holly Dunn, what is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay and classification are part-time, less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. So the insurance question, it, it, it comes up every single year. And I think I think it's pretty much one of those ones that you know people have a really strong opinion about, either for or for, against. And I'll tell you that when Kay and I first came in, and I'm... I'm not necessarily just always aligning myself with Kay, but I we just have worked and thought very closely about this issue. And I, I can tell you that even though it's a classified as like a part-time position uh, from a state standard, in any given moment, you're not part-time. And that is why it's illegal to not offer it to, you know, sit, like council and commissioners. And so it is an issue that we have looked into. And I, I can tell you uh, from my perspective, I, I feel like, Part of loving and serving Fayette County is doing what's best for our people. And if, if we can have a healthy community, what a, that is the, probably fundamentally the most important. So I'm not going to say that I, I like that it, I like spending money because I surely don't. And if, if you look at my history, uh, I'm very frugal. So like as a council person, even though I'm on the Democrat ticket, I think I'm probably one of the most conservative where it comes to spending money uh, on the council. So I don't like to spend money, but I, I, I like to follow the law. How about that? Thank you. Jim Wolf, what is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay and classification are part-time, less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. Well, <clears throat> age 72, I'm getting my own insurance, and that would save the county $180,000 a year if everybody didn't take it. Um, right now, on the opinion of it, there's nothing you can do to stop it because the law says if they want it, they can take it. And, uh, you know, it might not be right, but it's there. And if they want it, you know, it's up to them if they want to take it. If they feel right about taking it, but I'm on Social Security, I don't need it. Okay, thank you. John Gibson. What is your viewpoint on health insurance for county council members and county commissioners? Both offices in pay, in pay and classification are part-time, less than 28 hours per week. It would save the county thousands of dollars annually to eliminate this cost. Um, pretty much on lines. I mean, if it's legally has to be offered, um, then there's really nothing much you can do. Uh, me personally, I wouldn't need it and I wouldn't take it. Um, I'm covered by my employer. So, um, I mean, if it was an option, um, I, I don't see why the county commissioners would need it if it's going to save the county money. I, but as everybody said, and the experienced ones, <laughs> um, it's a legal issue. So there's not much you can do. Okay, thank you. Moving into our final question of the night, Holly Dunn. When do you say no to a county department's spending request? You know, I wish I didn't have to have an answer to this one. Uh, it, it happens. You have to say no. And it's uncomfortable, especially in a community as small as Fayette County. You know everyone, and you work side by side with people. But I'm going to tell you that as a council, we've had to say no lots of times. And actually, you know, we're currently, and I'm not trying to open a can of worms, we're currently in a situation where we've had to say no. and a county elected official is, is very unhappy with us. But I, I'm going to tell you that we're going to sit in a meeting together tomorrow and we're going to get along great. And it doesn't mean that I don't approve uh, of, of their work or uh, even have the ability to sit beside them and work collectively. We just have to agree to disagree on it. So sometimes our no's are hard, but we, we say them every year. Like it's, it's, it's a common thing. We want to pay our county employees more. As a council, wherever you stand right now, you'll, you'll at some point look at the budget and know that our county employees are paid less than uh, all the surrounding counties. I mean, every single elected, I mean, every single office. And, and you feel dirty at times because you want to pay them more. It's just not in the budget. And so we have to say no to raises almost every year. 
it, it's just a part of it. And, and, I, and they mostly understand, sometimes not so much. Okay, thank you. Jim Wolf. when do you say no to a county department spending request? When the, <clears throat> when the money's not there or you think that they don't need the additional money that they want. I sit on the council for eight years, and for eight years, it was no to for raises for the county council and commissioners. I figured that was a part-time job, so I, I said no. I mean, it was $4,800. I think it got raised this coming year. So, uh, but if you can prove to yourself and rest of the council that's not needed or it's a waste of money, vote no. Tom Peck, when do you say no to a county department spending request? So when I say no to a request is one, when the money is not there, and two, when they don't have a necessary reason for it. We have to start asking questions as you know, county council members. That's one of the reasons why we're there is to ask questions about why do you need this money, where is it going to go, and then what situation led you to needing this money at this point? Was it something that the council did in years previous that led to this gap in funding? Was it something else that could have been controlled? Is it a maintenance issue? Is it a personnel issue? Is it other things? We have to be able to understand the problems. We have to be able to say why and ask these questions and make these committee hearings and all these things uncomfortable because out of discomfort, out of pain comes growth at that point. Mm -hmm. Being able to say, hey, why do you need this? Where was my bad? Where was your bad? And then compromise on it. Maybe not this year, hopefully next year. Hopefully we can go and put a pin in this and get it to another point. Do you need it? Sometimes that you just can't make ends meet. I grew up in abject, I you know, spent five years in abject poverty in college. There's times that you just can't make the ends meet. It happens. People in this county know all about that. Going through and forward and trying to say that a certain group can get more than another group just because of the ask, it's not something that's possible. We are going to have to say no. It is going to happen. And we have to be able to find ways to make sure that we see where the problem started, where the problem came from, and then how we can fix the problem in the future. Scott Bevington. When do you say no to a county department spending request? Well, unfortunately, we may have to say no quite a bit over the next couple of years. Uh, one of the things that I want to give a lot of praise to the current county council about, um, with my friend Kay Payton's leadership, um, has been they, they were very uh, open with the, all of the department heads when they let them know, look, uh, the income projections we used to do budgets is because of COVID. It's just not going to be there. So um, cut your budgets. You know your offices better than we do. We don't want we don't want to cut any jobs out. So um, help us out and have reasonable expectations. So uh, I'd like that kind of process to continue on the county council so that we can avoid any kind of um, uh, unfortunate conversations like the one Ms. Dunn uh, mentioned earlier. John Gibson, when do you say no to a county department's spending request? Well, I mean, yes is the easy way. But and everybody likes to hear that and makes everybody feel good. But no is is harder to say sometimes, and it is the job of the departments to show the council why and why why they need that, and then the council, you know, has to decide the pluses and the minuses. And as mentioned. No is probably going to come up more often than not, um, especially because everything's going to get a whole lot tighter. Um, so for me, it's, it, it's it, if we don't have the money, then it's going to be, you know, no. 
Um, but it doesn't mean that wouldn't try our best if it is absolutely needed. Um, try to figure it out. But you know, no is it, it's it's always going to be likely. Thank you, K. Riker Payton. When do you say no to a county department spending request? Well, like Holly said, we say no a lot. <laughs> when the money's not there, it's not there. But, um, and like Scott alluded to this year, we went to the department heads and asked them to look at their budgets. And so everything, uh, let them look at it and let them cut it before they give it to us. So that worked out really well. It made things go much smoother. And, um, but I think some things that the public doesn't necessarily understand and, and only see on TV what we're approving, because you can spend certain, certain things out of certain funds and certain coffers, but you may not be able to spend that on this item over here. And that's where people get confused because it's, it's not, the budget, the county budget is not like a business budget where you have, you can move things around wherever you want. The county budget has very specific coffers, and you can only spend out of each coffer certain things. And then certain coffers get supplemented from the state that gives us money. So that's why you see the, the garage people and the, and the road uh, paving going on, because that's money they gave us, not money we're doing. So that's why I think a lot of people get confused when they see us approving big lots. It's because it's not really money that coming out of our general fund but we do say no a lot thank you we've now reached the end of the questions segment um i'd like to thank scott jim k holly tom and john for being here at this point we'll move into closing remarks you'll each have 90 seconds and we'll start with democrat john gibson 90 seconds uh first of all i want to say thank you for this opportunity to speak um and to give my you know, um, answers. Um, and if elected, I'll work my tail off. Um, I'll listen to the taxpayers and put the consideration to the, to the, to the departments and the, the, the workers, but the taxpayers are the ones we need to listen to and how they want their money spent. Um, with, but we have to do it within our means. Um, and I'm willing to do that. Um, I'll bring dedication, communication, listening, teamwork, and everything I possibly can. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll move to Kay Riker Payton. Kay, you have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Well, in closing, I just want to say that I have always, anytime anyone has ever texted me, called me, emailed me, whatever, I have always gotten back to them with an answer, even though it, it might not even be my under my jurisdiction or my ruling, whatever, I will direct them towards whoever they need to get with. I will always give them an answer or tell them who they need to speak to so they don't get this, oh, well, I don't know. I never tell anyone that. I always give them an answer or tell them what they need to do. So in a real short closing, I want to say if you want experience and dedication and genuine commitment to the county residents, I would really I would offer that to you, and I would appreciate your support. And thank you guys for hosting this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. This time we'll move to Tom Peck. Tom, you have 90 seconds for a closing statement. So I'm pretty transparent in all this, and that's been one of my major points in this is transparency and making sure that everyone knows exactly what I'm thinking. It's posted all over Facebook, Tom Peck for County Council. Go look at it. It's literally right there. Everything, I've, everything I want, everything I say, everything I talk about is there. All right. County Council, like has been talked about by Kay, by Holly, has very specific coffers, has very specific funds that need to go. The thing with County Council is, is that County Councilmen and County Councilwomen have the ears of the commissioners. They have the ears of state legislators. They have the ears of federal legislators. Okay. I'm sure each of us on this have the numbers of various campaign people in various different offices all over. We can get stuff done. We can go through and find stuff. I've talked about wanting a rotted transit in Fayette County. I've talked about no, no, no new retail space until the current retail spaces come up. 
those aren't things that county council can do, but these are ideas I can put out there and give to other people. County purchases vacant land, cuts tax abatements, increased funding for sidewalks, stopping new material spend. These are things that county council can do parts of and cannot do parts of, but guess what? I have a platform now. I'm putting it out there. This is what county council can do is say, we have TV time, let's go and put this forward. Jim Wolf, you now have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Uh, a little while ago, John Gibson said something <clears throat> that I want to bring up. He said, listen to the voices. Back when I was on there the last four years, uh, the commissioners was wanting to move the highway department to the end of Fiance Street, the old Fuzzy Lakes building. So uh, me and Mark Plum walked door to door on the Fiance, Woodbine, and Martin Street and ask those people, do you want the highway department there? No. Fiance Street is a small street. They didn't want the trucks going up down it. They also brought up about the railroad tracks that they're blocked off for an hour a day by the train. So we took it back and uh, we voted it down because we listened to the people's voices. They didn't want it out there. I lived over there. Uh, I grew up in East Connorsville, grew up on Fiance Street. I knew the streets were too small. Uh, I believe in God. I believe in uh, funding law enforcement, and I believe in the Second Amendment. I do not believe in abortion. This is why I went from Democrat to Republican. I was asked to run. This is why I'm running. And if you vote for me, your tax dollars will not be wasted. I've done it for eight years. I can do it for four more years. Thank you for having us tonight. Thank you. Holly Dunn, you now have 90 seconds for a closing statement. Sure. Again, thank you so much for hosting this event. And honestly, I'm going to tell you thank you to every single person up here. Because being a public servant is without a doubt uh, one of the most thankless positions you could ever have. And, and I'll tell you that if you could find it in your heart to vote for me, I bring uh, a lot more than I've even said here tonight. Uh, humbly, I try not to just boast, but I have essentially two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree focus on public policy at the master's level and have have spoken to legislators on on a variety of issues and i tell you that uh, I, we have the four years experience i can work as a team member i i, I don't see this necessarily as a democrat or a republican uh, position i see this as a public servant position and if you could uh, give me another opportunity i'll be glad to continue to serve you to the best of my abilities to, to hear you wherever you want to talk to me and uh, continue to seek out new opportunities to save money and support you uh, as fayette county Thank you. scott you have 90 seconds for scott benvington have 90 seconds for a closing statement when I returned home 28 years ago, it was very apparent how behind our community was. Over the years, I've been able to help make a few improvements that I'm very proud of, yet it wasn't nearly enough, and I knew it. To do more would require the kind of political will that, frankly, just didn't exist. Bistion was still around, and many people were still earning a comfortable living. And I also began noticing that my kids were growing up way too fast. All of that led me to stop running for office back then. Today, we're 13 years beyond Vistian. Since 1980, we've lost nearly 20% of our population, our full service hospital, half our elementary schools, more jobs than I care to count, and our drug problem is now profound. So I'm hopeful that today, the political will now exists that will create the kind of change to get the job done. Personally, three of our four now grown children and both grandchildren still live here. I think it's important to leave future generations with a community better than the one we were given. I've garnered more experience over the last few years that I think can help, and I'd like to help. That's why I'm running again. But I leave you with this. President Kennedy once said, let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix blame for the past, but let us accept our own responsibility for the future. It is that with which I will carry into this job every day if you give me the opportunity. I'd appreciate your vote on November 3rd. Thank you for your time and consideration. Good night. Thank you very much. We appreciate all of our candidates for the Fayette County Board of Education. 
uh, School Board and for all of our candidates here tonight for the Fayette County Council. As we said earlier in our opening statement, Fayette County voters, this event was for you tonight. You're going to determine the leadership of our county and the men and women that are willing to give of their time, give of their effort and their knowledge and their love for this community. So I hope you listened well because you need to choose wisely. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and we're adjourned.